About a year ago, Daniel Schiffman from The Coding Train, who we all know and love, did a live stream where he attempted to recreate a water ripple effect that he'd created in processing inside a shader in P5.js. And he gave it a red hot go, but after about two hours of battling with it, he unfortunately got bested. So we're going to try and give him a hand today and create the water ripple effect in a shader in P5.js. If you don't know who Dan Schiffman is, I have no idea how you found my channel. He runs the best creative coding channel on YouTube, and I'll leave a link in the description to the live stream, as well as the original video he did on the water ripple effect. And if you don't know what P5.js is, it's a really great tool for making creative coding projects in the browser in JavaScript really easily. In Dan's original Water Ripple video, he references an article by Hugo Elias, which I'm also going to be referencing, and I will leave a link in the description as well. You can see it calls for two different buffers, one that holds the current state of the water ripples and one that holds the previous state, and we're going to be using graphic objects for this. To figure out the next state of any given pixel, we apply this formula here, where we add up the neighboring pixel's previous state and divide it by two, and then subtract the value of the current state. And then we apply a dampening to it so that our ripples lose energy over time and don't just spread out everywhere. Then at the end, we just need to update our current and previous buffers so that they're holding the correct information. So what does this actually look like in code? We're gonna start with the fragment shader because this is where the main bulk of the algorithm happens. There is a bit of setup inside P5.js to get this working though, so make sure you stick around for that. The first thing we do is define a few uniforms and these are variables that we can set from the JavaScript inside the shader. POS holds the position of the pixel we're currently operating on and this will change for each instance of the shader code, which is why it's prefixed with the varying keyword. This variable is set from the vertex shader, which we'll have a look at in a minute, and you have to make sure that the names match between the two files. The position values in GLSL go between 0 and 1, which isn't very helpful when we're trying to do things like look at neighboring pixels. So we have to pass in the resolution of the screen so that we can figure out how big a pixel is. We then have two images that hold the current and the previous state, as well as a dampening value. Inside the main function, we read the current buffer to get the state of our current location, and we read the previous state for the four neighboring pixels using our screen resolution to know how far to offset the position in each of the four directions. We can then perform the calculation described in the article and output the result in the final color. If you just wanted black and white ripples, you could output the next value in the RG and B channels, but I wanted to have a nice blue. To get this, I've got the blue channel always maxed out as one and I've got the green channel scaled between 0.5 and one. Importantly, the red channel actually holds the value of the state. And you can see when we're reading in the state values, I'm actually reading the R channel because this is where the state is actually stored. I highly encourage you to play around with how this next value is interpreted as a color. And I would love to see with the results that you guys come up with. So that's it for the fragment shader. Let's check out the vertex shader now. I won't go into too much detail here because there isn't really a lot going on. As you can see, I've got a vec2 called pos that matches the one from the fragment shader. And we just set that to the a text coord value, which is given to us. And we flip the y axis. And this is important because otherwise you get this. And everything else is shamelessly stolen from a vertex shader I found online. For this whole effect to work, we have to be able to read the output of the shader and store that in our current buffer and then feed that current buffer back into the shader. And we do this from inside the P5.js. But before we do that, I would really appreciate it if you gave this video a thumbs up to help it spread to more people and hopefully even Daniel Schiffman himself. Before we get into the buffer swapping stuff, we have to do a bit of setup first. So we've got to define our ripple shader as well as our current and previous buffers. And I've also got a damping value here, which I've set to 0.99, but feel free to fiddle around with this one. In the preload function, we load in the fragment and vertex shaders into our ripple shader. And then in the setup, we create the canvas as well as our two graphics objects for our buffers. I've set the pixel density to one and turned off smoothing just to make our shaders play nice with reading neighboring pixels. We can then set the main canvas to use the ripple shader and we can use the set uniform function to set the variables inside our fragment shader that we were discussing earlier. Moving on to the draw function, we first check if the mouse is pressed and if it is, we draw a white point at the mouse location and this will cause ripples to come from the mouse if it's being pressed. And you'll note that I have to offset the mouse location by half the width and height and this is because in WebGL mode the center of the screen is actually the 0 0 coordinate. I also add another point randomly somewhere on the canvas at a random brightness value and this will create this raindrop effect. And then finally we get into the buffer swapping. Since our buffers are graphics objects this is actually incredibly straightforward. We can use the image function to draw our current buffer into the previous one and then use the get function to get the current frame and draw that into our current buffer. We can then use set uniform again to set the current and previous buffers into our shader and then drawing a rectangle on the screen will trigger our shader to run and create the water ripple effect and that's it. We've created a shader inside P5.js that creates this really amazing look water ripple effect. And Dan, if you're watching this, I really hope this has helped you out. I'll leave a link in the description where you can find this code and run it for yourself in the browser and play around with it. 
If you enjoyed this video, there's another one here that you might enjoy where I make Conway's Game of Life in a shader. I'll see you next time.